first of all, I just got um, a, a little demonstration which in some ways typifies um, what I've been doing over 30 years using APL and statistics. So hope, let's hope this works. Well, there we are. We've got, we've got a vector of, of values, not very interesting. <coughs> and we've got a program called mean. <coughs> uh, I'm sure you all know what it looks like. It's using uh, John's direct definition. Um, I suppose I can show it, can't I? There it is. Nothing very surprising about that. Uh, and goodness me, it works. Let's see. Uh, there, it works. Good. So, I've got that vector up there, mean, so let's have the mean of x. And it doesn't work. And, of course, I'm sure you've all worked out by now what's happened. Uh, I've carefully not shown all of x, and x has got a missing value. So, good though APL is for doing statistics, it does mean that if you really want to be a, use it in a practical context, you really have to have something more than just the raw APL. <clears throat> because if you get a database from, shall we say, a, a medical application, it's going to be incredibly messy. And it's not going to be nice and neat. It's going to have missing values and all sorts of things you need to do uh, before you can really hit it with the typical APL functions that work on nice and neat data. So, well, in a way, that demonstrate, demonstration demonstrates my involvement with APL in an academic way um, over 30-odd years. It's terrible, really, to think about it that, that way. It makes me really want to go and hide my head in shame. But let's, let's see if we can redress the balance a little bit. Okay. So that was the genuine beginning of my uh, talk, but I'm going to um, load the workspace now, which is represents a, a year's part-time work on um, looking at how object-oriented a APL can help us in the statistics environment. Um, I say part-time work, obviously, um, being retired, one has to do all sorts of things to keep, um, keep the estate to, uh, ticking over. Um, and as I was talking to John over, over breakfast, uh, one of my great enjoyments in retirement is using a different type of keyboard, um, uh, in like this case, a pipe organ keyboard. So, let's see. Okay, what I was going to do to start with was to show you how the object-oriented um, features are used, starting at a very low level from the keyboard, and then working up to something with some uh, um, GUI stuff that will work um, and give you the sort of environment I think that um, is, is helpful in the statistical context. I'm going to totally reverse that uh, and show you the GUI stuff and then come back to the details of how that's done if we have time. If we don't have time, those details are actually in the conference paper anyway. So you're not going to miss out if I do run out of time. Okay, so um, one of the things I did when I took a course in regression and generalized linear models was to try and get my students a little bit more involved with the data. Um, and so I sent them out to uh, collect some very simple house price data. Uh, this seems to be sort of pervaded. It's almost like ducks. Uh, in, in, in the APL environment at the moment because due to Adrian's uh, wonderful graphics and, and Adrian's presentations, you will probably, a lot of you have already seen Swansea house price data appearing. Well, that's how it appeared, that's how it originated was by me collecting and my students collecting a certain amount of data which would allow them to fit some regression models. Uh, and the whole aim of the exercise there was that if they had been involved in collecting the data, A, they knew a bit about it, uh, and B, they, they would have already started thinking about, well, what can we do with it? So um, I'm going to open this house data. And this is um, just saved in an APL component file, uh, which has all the um, gubbins of the um, database involved. 
Uh, if I opened it without the left argument, then I would just be opening it in the keyboard context. Okay, so what have we got here, um, roughly? John said, and I'm sure he's very wise, keep it simple. I have tried to keep it simple, but uh, when, when you're doing statistical work, you, you need to keep an eye on your data. It's always useful to keep an eye on your data. You do want some output, uh, and you do want some graphics output, and they've all got to be on the screen there somewhere and readily available. So the basic layout that I've got here, the top left-hand corner of this spin box is just uh, to alter quad PP in the namespace. That's, that's straightforward. You can see that I've got a tab here with my data. I've got here an empty tab, which is going to contain the, eventually the methods and um, options available when we create a sub-object from this database object, which has some statistical content. So that's where that's going to go. On the right-hand side, we've got a text output, as you can see, which is a standard RTF um, box. Uh, and we will have other tabs appearing as we produce graphics. Okay, um, let's go through the menus very quickly. Um, fairly standard things. I can open the file, previously saved file. I can open an Excel file, courtesy of uh, Morton's um, uh, OLE client stuff. I can save file, I can save ours. I've got a print output, and I'll show you the um, printing the output of everything that we do in a session here. That's using Adrian's uh, new leaf uh, as output at the moment. And I can turn that printing to file on or off. Um, we've got various views that will come later. There are error messages as one does something simple, uh, something um, right or uh, something wrong as you go along. Um, I can either send those errors to a message box uh, which is useful if you like that sort of thing, but it gets a bit tedious sometimes uh, clicking the damn thing to go away. So I also send, have the option to send the errors to the RTF viewer. <clears throat> then we've got various database, the sort of things you would expect. Um, I've got a, um, a system variable called underscore cases. Uh, the system variables start with under, underscore, so hopefully people won't use that and create name clashes. Uh, and I'm not allowed to write to that even if I uh, um, put the editing on. Then I've got these typical variables. Um, anybody that's not familiar with the house price data, these are the, well, I can show you what they are. Let's have a look at um, the variable labels. They are the price of houses in Swansea. This is taken a long time ago in units of 1,000 um, pounds. The area is just the floor area in square feet. Bed is the number of bedrooms. Type is the type of house um, that we've got and age in years. Okay. Now, so that illustrates one of the nice things that, in a sense about object-oriented um, uh, Facilities, if I have a variable, um, if it's in an object-oriented structure, I can attach to that things like labels uh, so that they can be used in graphical outputs. And also, um, going a little bit deeper into the variables, um, sometimes, uh, for instance, this type of house, type 1, 2, 3, 4, that means absolutely nothing to you, I guess, unless you've really seen this data in detail. Um, but there are some value labels attached to those values. Uh, now, this is not the easiest way to see this, but um, you will see that I've basically got an array here which I can edit, and each bracket begins with a number, which is, corresponds to the number in the type here, and then 
a quote to correspond to it. So one stands for what we call a terraced house. So terraced, a house which is joined to a large number of houses altogether, um, and so on. Okay. Now, if you want that sort of information available to you, um, so that we're coming to this uh, database um, afresh, we can look at the formatting uh, options that we've got here, so we can format these variables. And for the type here, I can say, show me those labels. Or even better, I think if I go on down, I can show both the value and the labels. So if I do that, so let's apply, then for this type thing, you know, if I you can begin to see, I won't bother doing this um, exactly, but you can see now that those numbers, sorry, I've gone the wrong way. Those numbers, one, two, three, four, now are attached with their labels. So that makes it very easy to be in contact, not only with the numbers, um, but with that those numbers represent. And both those are really very useful because if I want to select um, only terraced houses, then I need to know that terraced houses are the number one. Uh, so having them both together is quite useful. Okay, so just looking at that database again, uh, um, I can compute a new variable. I'll show you that perhaps from the session later on. Um, and that computing is you know, typically not very easy because obviously you might be using variables in the database which um, have missing values. Uh, and so doing that is, is to, was for me anyway a little bit tricky. Okay, um, the other thing is, let's have a look at this. I can look at missing values. Right, something wrong there, but I won't go into it. Um, what I've tried to do with missing values here is to create uh, a grid here which will allow me to add other missing values. Now, that may seem a little bit strange, but if you're looking at survey data, then survey data, if it's correctly coded, um, will have a code for a value that's, being, that's actually missing. So if... Um, if Joe Bloggs on the high streets interviews um, somebody and uh, says, well, what do you do? And they say, well, I'm not prepared to tell you. That's a missing value. But if they are doing that survey work correctly, that missing value will get coded with a number. And the reason for that is, if you think about it, it's quite, it, it, it is a sensible decision because clearly if you're using that variable to predict something else, something else, then it has to be a missing value. But on the other hand, if you are wanting to explore in that database what type of people didn't enter that field, weren't prepared to release it, then it is not a missing value. You want it to have a number so that you can actually do some analysis on it. So the missing values split into what I call system missing values, anything that might be thrown at the APL interpreter, which clearly means there's nothing there, um, and there should be a quad null in, in that as well. Uh, but on the other hand, I might want to add to a particular variable in a, for a particular analysis that I want to do a missing value so that those cases are then removed from the analysis. Okay. So, Let's do some statistics then. This is a simple database and it doesn't have any missing values, so I shouldn't run into any problems with that. What I've got on the analyze button here really represents the sort of things that students would meet in, in, in an introductory course in statistics. Almost everything that I taught to some uh, psychology students towards the end of my career using SPSS is on here. Um, the one exception to that is the regression and generalized linear models, which is the sort of thing a third-year statistics student would use and, and, and discuss. And they really are, they go a long way to providing a lot of modeling, uh, to providing the analysis for a lot of different models. 
much, much wider set of models than, than, than regression. But let's just start something fairly sim simple. Supposing I want to know something about these house prices. So let's look at what I call univariate statistics. I'm going to look at a simple variable and look at its properties. Okay. So basically, I have to have some GUI, in this case, this is the simplest thing, to say, well, what variable do I want to look at? Well, I want to look at the prices. So far, effectively, I haven't done anything in terms of creating any more objects than the database object. And incidentally, this GUI wrap here is just another database object which inherits the properties of the main database object. As soon as I press the Analyze button, this creates a sub-object, um, which is my Unistats object, uh, which will give me the sort of things that um, I need to have uh, for that. Now, the way I decided to do it was to provide basically a grid object, um, which allowed you then to tick off the sort of things that you might want to do with it. And as you can see, some of them are already pre-ticked. So that allows me, I suppose, as a statistician to say, well, you know, what ought you to be able to get purely by default? So I've got a mean and standard deviation clicked there. Um, at the bottom, I've got a histogram and a box plot. Now, just to explain this a little bit more clearly, um, these have... Um, you can see here I'm working from right to left, from right to left, sorry. Uh, it's supposed to be a joke, but I'm not as good as John at presenting jokes. Um, so these are the right arguments of these methods for the Unistats object in my database. Okay. Some of them just give straightforward output and so don't have any right argument, hence the grid object is grey here. Some of them do allow you to take right arguments, and the right arguments here are put there as suggestions and helps to explain to you what's going on here. So, for instance, if we're doing a t what's called a t-test, what we're doing I've lost... Oh, no, I haven't lost. Uh, of a particular variable. It doesn't, the hypothesis value for that t-test doesn't have to be zero, but very often it is. So if I just click on that and replace a different value, it doesn't have to have the hypothesis value in there. All that is just out. So um, let's see whether the mean of the house prices is significantly different from 60. That's 60,000 pounds. Okay, so at this stage, we've created the database objects. All these methods are available to me. All I have to do then is to choose to execute those and report back. So as you can see, what's happened here is I've now got two pages of graphics. Um, I am a great believer that you actually look at pictures. They can tell you an awful lot. And... and um, in, in this case, the database, this um, box plot doesn't tell you a great deal, except it suggests that we've got two cases here, cases 5 and 24, which are outliers. Okay? If we want to look at this a little bit in bigger version, then on the view menu now, I can view that page 1 graphics. Uh, and that's just Adrian's um, Causeway graphics um, default uh, display. And that gives me then the facilities to send it to the printer and to print this page. So all that work was done for me. All I had to do was to uh, uh, do that. Sorry, I've done that on page one, which is the histogram rather than page two. There's the histogram, and let's look at the text. Okay. Um, so very little output there. I can't have actually ticked the um, t-test, can I? No, I put the, so let's do that again. And let's look back at my text output. So now I've got testing the hypothesis that true mean is 60. I've got various repeat of some of the statistics up here. But somewhere in there, I've got a p-value, which is 0 0.005. Uh, 
And this is telling me that there's a good deal of evidence to suggest that the mean is not 60. And in fact, these confidence intervals here shows you that 60 is not inside it. So this is all very typical um, stats output. Um, some of you will be familiar with it. Some of you have had the good fortune to not be so familiar with it. Okay, so that's, that's a typical um, output of a particular model. Now, supposing I went back to the database here um, and I selected cases. I'm not going to do this because it'll just take me a little bit more time and I want you to see some more of these models working. But if I went to the database and selected some cases and then came back to my univariate statistics, for instance, if I wanted to delete those outliers, um, um, Let's, may, may, maybe we've got time to do it. Let's just go back to page, graph page two. Um, five and 24 were outliers. So if I went to the database and said I want to select cases, I could say, um, put an expression. Um, what do I want here? Um, sorry, yes. I don't need that. Okay. Cases, I've got um, a variable cases. Um, let's put in cases does not belong to, sorry, 5 and 24. Okay, and so you can see that should be 5 and 24. Did I, did I type that wrongly? Sorry. Sorry? <laughs> I hope not. I knew I'd get into a mess when I started doing things off the cuff. Sorry. I think I typed 23 in there. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I'm looking at the... Uh, sorry. No, 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 it is all right. He says... That's case 5 and case 23 because the cases are not in the right order. So it is okay. So I've now deleted those cases. Now the point I wanted to make was now if we go back to the universe statistics, if I just do the options at that point, I'm still doing it on the original sub-object that I've created. So I do, and I suppose at this point that do option should be blanked out, and that's something I will do. Uh, so basically I have to create the object again by analyze, and then I can do the object, uh, do the options again. And I've deleted those outliers. I should get a different output to my results here. And yes, you can see that the p-value has dropped 2.01. So there were outliers, but they didn't actually make any difference to the results. Okay, so that gives you a flavor of, uh, of the sort of things that you would want to do in any statistical analysis. And... I have to say that although the GUI environment is a difficult one to get to, to cope with, and of course all um, statistical um, facilities which use the GUI environment use it in a different way, it is an ideal way of doing data analysis because you never know until you start to do something and explore data what you really want to do. And to, it does save you an awful lot of time in going back, selecting cases, and then redoing um, the calculations. It is a very, very natural facility for doing statistics. Okay. Um, let's have a um, briefly look um, at some other things that we can do with this database. Here I've just looked at one variable, how do prices vary? Um, I might want to say, well, how do prices vary with the area of, in other words, how big the house is? So uh, that would mean that I want to do some regression, okay? So if I'm in regression, I want to say, what variable do I want to predict? And how do I want to predict it? Okay, well, some of you have seen this sort of thing uh, in presentations before. GM just means what I'm going to do is to fit a line of the form prices equals a constant plus uh, another constant times area. Um, GM just stands for that initial constant. 
Okay, so I want to put in area there. Now I can either type in area or I can use the um, right argument, uh, sorry, right click button and, and type in area there. So that gives me a model. I fit the model, and that gives me various um, options, and I'm just going to do the default options um, and see what we get out. So this gives me the single regressive variable plot gives me, uh, tells me how price is predicted by area. We can see we've actually, it's not a terribly good fit, but it's a clearly a Okay, and the text output will give me the information, and this will tell me this figure here, 0.0403, will tell me that basically the house prices go up by about 40, 40 pounds for every extra. Okay, so at least it did in 1970, whatever these things were, the 1980s were collected. So that's the sort of thing you can do. Now, you can fit all sorts of models here. With so that I, that would effectively be fitting different regression lines for time. I'll show What else might I want to do? Um, how do house prices vary with the type of house? Remember, we have these different types of house. Am I doing something wrong? No, no, it's just wrong. Right. Thank you. Um, so I've got this, what we call qualitative variable type of house. Um, obviously, I'm not going to do a regression, but it's quite likely that terraced houses usually are somewhat cheaper than the other types of houses. So this means basically what I want to do is to fit a model where I have a different average value for the different types of houses. Now, I can do that within the regression analysis, um, but I can also do it in what's called the one-way analysis of variance. So these are all techniques which mean something to statisticians. Um, so, I have, again, the variable I want to um, predict, if, effect, if you like, and then the type of house um, I have to declare. Okay, and let's just do the default options. I'll just put a rank it plot there. Okay. When we're doing these analyses, just to link back to the wonderfully interesting lecture we had on snooping uh, yesterday, where the speaker talked about likelihood. Likelihoods are here, uh, all working all the time in calculating these estimates. There's no base theorem, but the likelihoods are there. And the likelihoods, in order to have a likelihood in this context, you have to make an assumption about the distribution of the error term, what the noise is in the system. And the usual uh, assumption is that it has a normal or Gaussian distribution. That's usually something that you ought to check. And one of the ways of checking it is by doing what's called a rank it plot with 1 in 20 bounds. So if these plots here, which represent the error terms, are in the, within these simulated 1 in 20 bounds, um, then you're pretty sure that the sort of confidence intervals and, t uh, uh, and the significance tests are going to be meaningful. Okay? It's a... This, this is a simulated 1 in 20 bounds simply because we can't do the arithmetic. Um, there's the box plot which um, gives you how the, different, how the data is varying within the different types of house. Again, if we want to look at that a little bit um, closer, you might see the titles a little bit better. So the cheaper houses are the terrace houses. Um, these are semi-detached houses. That might not mean much to people outside the UK. That's where you've got two houses with a common internal wall. Detached houses mean, obviously, self-contained house on its own plot. And a bungalow is one where you don't have any upstairs. Uh, I guess that comes from India, doesn't it, from the colonial days. Uh, so that gives you a rough idea of how 
what is happening here. When we do the one-way analysis of variance, what we're doing is testing the hypothesis that the means of all these different distributions of house prices for the different types are the same. And so let's close that go and go back to my text output. And down here, I've got a F, uh, uh, an F statistic and a p-value of 0.07. Um, so that's suggesting that it's borderline significant. Okay. In fact, I think I've still got those two data items not selected. I think that would have been come out to be significant if I had them unselected. Uh, sorry, if I had them selected rather than unselected. Okay. So again, what we've been able to do, an entirely different type of analysis, get lots of results on it, and we're able to interpret the results. Sorry, sorry. So that the yes, that means the different types of houses are different, yeah, significantly different, yeah. Okay. Right, I'm rapidly running out of time. I want to show you another interesting thing on the different database. So let's quickly move to um, opening another file. Um, Right. Let me ex and this explains another facility that we're able to use in here. You notice that I had a variable called underscore C freak. Um, that is telling you what the frequency is of that particular case. Now, normally you have a frequency of one in that situation. But if I can explain to you very quickly what the um, context is of this particular set of data is, is that these are the degree results at a well-known university, I won't say which. The type of degree is first class 2122 third, and they will appear in the outputs because they, we've got labels to attach those numbers. We've got different faculties in the university, engineering, art science, and so on. Um, and so this frequency of 29 says that in faculty one, there were 29 first class degrees. Okay. And so the database then just goes through all levels of degree for all faculties. What is a very interesting question there is to say, ask the question, well, do the proportions of first, two ones, two twos, and thirds vary with the faculty, or are they the same? To do that, you have to basically create the sort of crosstabs that Adrian was doing so eloquently uh, and easily with his uh, um, Q does a flip, uh, and create the, basically create the frequencies that we've got here um, as a table, and then do what we call a chi-squared test on it. So we need to do what we call a cross-tabulation here. So I need to choose the variable that I want, the faculty, uh, against the degree. Let's create the object. And let's do the options. Okay, I'll come back to do the options again. Okay. Uh, well, it's nice to have a bit of three-dimensional graphics. Those represent those frequencies for the um, two categories of two variables. And we've got some text output here. And we've got a chi-squared statistic here with a p-value which is so small it's recorded as zero. The interpretation of that is that, yes, those, these proportions of first two one-thirds and so on in the different faculties do vary and vary quite significantly. And it's always annoyed me um, that students stop at that point, um, say, well, okay, I've done, the t I've done the test, I've got the conclusion, I've finished. And, of course, that's, where, that's the boring statistics part. Is the thing that it's the necessary thing that you've got to do in order to be able to say something. But once you've said it, then you've got to say, well, you know, how do they vary? What's contributing to the significance? And... I found it very difficult to get students to produce this kind of um, output. So let's just do that options again. So what I've got here now is a separate grid object. You can see now the labels coming in here, engineering, business, business social studies, and so on, and the, for the different types of degrees. Now then for each cross component, you've got three values here. 
there's the observed value. What the chi-squared test has done is calculate what it thinks you would expect to have there if there was no variation in these proportions for, in the different faculties. And then I've got what we call a standardized residual. Now, I've used color here to indicate those cells where I've got a significant, well, the red color is telling me that, I, that the 29 and the 13.87 are really quite large, they are significantly different in some loose sense. Whereas the blue ones are telling me that 54 and 67 are significantly under the expected, 54 is significantly underneath the expected 87. So then you look at the pattern of colors that you've got there, and it then becomes clear what's happening. If you're in a quantitative subject, science and engineering, then firsts and thirds become much more likely. If you're in the more subjective, the more discursive subjects of arts and social studies, then the degree scheme classifications tend to cluster in the middle. That's what I would hope my intelligence students would come up with, and it took a great deal of persuasion to get them to do this table and to do the analysis. But in the end, that's the sort of thing that you want to be able to see. Okay. I've got one more, I know it's not leaving much time for analysis, but I've got one more thing I would like to show you. Um, and let's just go back to the house data so that we know what we're dealing with. In here, I've got a thing called scatterplot plot modeling. And this is something, I think, um, following on the sort of work that Adrian does, it's always useful to be able to play around with scatter plots and fit different models. So I'm going to look at my prices, house prices. I'm going to throw in the fact that I've got different types of houses. Oh, sorry, that's not the wrong, wrong thing. I'm going to regress it on area because I know they vary with area. I'm going to take into account the type of house. And I've also got what I call the thumbnail variable. And I'm going to set that to the type of house again. Okay. Now, I, this allows me to fit regression models. And if I'm fitting regression models, do I want the intercepts to vary with the type of house? Or do I want them to be the same? So if I take that, I get different intercepts for the different levels of type. Um, do I want the regression coefficients to vary for the different types? Yes. Uh, and I want to have a linear predictor rather than a quadratic <coughs> predictor. So those are the options I've got there. Now, so what I've got here is um, obviously a scatter plot with a different type, different markers for different types of house. I haven't got a key here, but what I have got here in the thumbnail variable is a bar chart for the different types of house. So I click on one, that seat you can show here that it's fitted a terraced house, and these are the terraced houses. Okay? And if I click on two, and so on. So you can go through in that sort of way. And if you just go back to my scatter plot, um, if I fit the plot, I get, should get lines. Because I've allowed different intercepts, those lines are not parallel. Um, and they've got different slopes. And so if I again go back to the scatter plot, um, I'll come back to the uh, thing there, I can see which line goes with which set of points much more easily than, than just with the markers. So I can go through, through looking what's happening. Okay, that tells me the sort of thing where I might want more information out about these models, um, but I have got uh, if I go into the thing, I have got, you can get the estimate table for the model there as a tip field, and you can get the model fit there. So that's a quick summary. As I suspected, um, but I'm quite relieved in a way, um, I haven't shown you the stuff that's in the, um, in the printed version which shows you how all this is built up. I'm quite glad because I'm hopeless at typing. Um, uh, and uh, so I'm quite glad to have avoided that and uh, got through the GUI presentation without anything falling over. So thank you very much for your patience in listening. Thank you.